All right, y'all. It has been a very long day, so I'm going to just try to do this one shot straight through and see how this works. Uh, I wanted to just do what I normally do and steal my YouTube video from the parish from this morning from, from the 9 o'clock Mass and just throw that on my webpage, and there you go. You can find the homily and watch it. And I can't do that because, once again, we had some kind of bizarre technical difficulties with the live stream. I don't think that the Mass even went live. The, the later Mass, the 11 o'clock, went live, but that's not the one I had. And I don't know why this keeps happening. Because it's the same guy that's always done it, that's that's doing it, and, and he hasn't changed anything in terms of what he's setting up. I just don't know why he doesn't want to sync with our accounts or whatever. And... Um, it's probably something stupid and easy to fix, and and we just haven't figured it out yet. We have a long-term solution in the works, and I know I've said that before, but but we do. So hopefully, eventually, this won't be a problem. But till then, um, I was just going to let it go and not post anything. But then I thought, you know, you're not on the live stream next week either, and you wanted to start trying to do more stuff on your YouTube anyway. So why don't you just try to record something tonight? And throw it up there. And so here I am. Problem is that it's been a couple hours now since my last Mass. And I'm tired. So I'm not sure how well this is going to work. If I'm going to remember everything I wanted to say. But eh, deal with it. I'm not going to reread the readings to you. Because uh, I'm just not going to do that. So if you're going to have to go back and look for those yourselves. Or listen to them yourselves somewhere else. I'm just going to jump right into things. So here we go. So wedding season for me is over. It ended officially last weekend. That was my last wedding for 2023. The book is closed until May of next year, I think, is my first one. And uh, and I'm okay with that. You know, weddings are not... This is going to sound wrong. Weddings are not my favorite thing to do. They're just not, you know. And, and, and a lot of priests will tell you that. A lot of priests will tell you that they prefer doing funerals to weddings. And, like, by a wide margin. They would rather do three, four, five funerals to every one wedding. And sometimes I totally get that, you know, um, for reasons we'll talk about. So it's kind of reassuring to know that, that, you know, Jesus presents a parable with a wedding where things go off the rails. So at least it's not just me. But on the other hand, it's like I just got out of wedding season and now I have to preach about a wedding parable. That's great. Um, but no, you know, like marriage is great. We love marriage. We support marriage. We want your marriages to be happy and healthy and holy and life-giving. And we want you to fill the church up with kids and all that kind of good stuff. Like, we like marriage. We get excited when people have the big milestone anniversaries. It's just that your wedding. Weddings take ordinary, normal, kind, sane people and turn them into the opposite of all of those adjectives that I just used. Uh, and they are just a disaster sometimes. Um, their, their chaos and their just ridiculousness and people do and ask for things at weddings that they would never do or ask for probably in any other situation. And then once you get on the other side of the wedding, everything is normal again. And it's just so strange. The only thing worse than a wedding is the wedding rehearsal. Wedding rehearsals are like the worst. You know, we spend 20 minutes at a wedding rehearsal practicing walking into church. I walk into the church every day, sometimes two or three times a day if it's Sunday. You know how you walk from the back of the church to the front? You put one foot in front of the other and try real hard not to trip. Why does it take 20 minutes to do this? Like, it doesn't, I just don't understand. I just don't. So at the end of every wedding rehearsal now, I sit down the, the, whole bridal party parents grandparents anybody that's there you will sit down and you will listen and i tell them that i'm going to retire in about 27 more years and when i retire i plan on writing a book and this book will tell the stories of all the crazy stuff that has happened at weddings and your goal for the next 24 hours is to do nothing that would land you into my book you don't want to be there and then I will go through a series of rules that I have developed over many years of doing this, that if they keep these rules, it should keep them out of the book altogether. And most of these rules revolve around two key principles, punctuality and sobriety, because those are things that it seems that people struggle with when it comes to weddings. Don't know why. I'll tell you one story. I'm not going to tell you all of them because it's not the point. And plus, I want you to buy the book when it eventually comes out. But, uh, 
I had this one crazy wedding that is the third wedding I ever did. And for years I have been misrepresenting this wedding to other people because I keep saying this was the first wedding I ever did. No, no, it was so bad that I for, it literally made me forget about the first two. I went back and looked at the calendar, and it turns out I had done two weddings before this one for two very lovely, normal, sane couples. But then there was this one, and it was just nuts. And I should have known that it was going to be that way from the very start, because our dear bride had 13 bridesmaids. Not 13 people in her wedding party total, she had 13 bridesmaids. The groom did his best to keep up with her, but fell a little bit short. He only, only, had 11 groomsmen. So that was just insane. And then there was a complicating factor. They wanted to get married on a Friday afternoon. It's not common by any stretch, but like, it's not, it's not ridiculous. It's not like, out of the, not completely impossible. And it makes a certain amount of sense, right? Because if you're trying to save some money um, on a reception venue, often it is cheaper to do it on a Friday. Also, just scheduling things. I mean, maybe there were no available Saturdays, but they could get a Friday. So you want to do a Friday afternoon wedding? Okay, we can make that work. Now, the problem was that this particular Friday afternoon wedding, they insisted had to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Again, like, that's probably okay. We can make that work most of the time. But this was the middle of September. And the parish I was at had a school. A school that had six buses, seven buses pulling up to it every afternoon, plus how many different scores of parents in their cars to pick up their kids. So you can't have a wedding that's going to take, like, multiple limousines to drop off your army of bridesmaids and groomsmen showing up at the same time as all these school buses and stuff. You can't do a two o'clock wedding on a Friday. Not in that church anyway. And I told them that. I was like, we have to move this back a little bit. You know, we're happy to do it on a Friday afternoon, but two o'clock just isn't going to cut it for me. It's, it's just not possible. Got to keep these kids safe. Well, they didn't, I don't think they wanted to hear that. And she tried to negotiate. It's like, sweetheart, we're not we're not negotiating. I'm just telling you, it's not going to be a two. It's going to be later than that. So I thought we had worked something out. I thought three o'clock was the hour we had settled on. And, and we had settled on that. I was not thrilled with three o'clock. I would have preferred three 30, but she settled for three because she still wanted this to be as early as possible. Or so I thought, but I think at some point she changed her mind and decided that actually she wanted it to be later than that. And that would have been fine. And all she would have had to have done was ask. But she never communicated that to me. So three o'clock came. And three o'clock went on the day of the wedding. And I didn't have a bride. I had a groom. I had a plethora of groomsmen. We might have had quorum at that point. But, but I didn't have a bride. And I actually didn't even have that many people in church. 3 o'clock turned to 3.15, 3.15 turned into 3.30, I still didn't have a bride. 3.45 rolls around. I'm panicking. I'm, I'm going back and forth between anger and fear because, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to this poor groom. And also, like, why isn't, why isn't anyone telling me anything? Um, you know, but people are starting to filter into the church and I keep asking the groom, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And he's like, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. She's going to be here. It's fine. Finally, she showed up at 10 after 4. 10 after 4 for a 3 o'clock wedding. And I guess this whole thing was planned. Because what I learned was that they stopped on their way to the church. Well, first of all, they were, they were coming from the hotel where their reception was going to be. The hotel in question was the Renaissance in downtown Pittsburgh. The hotel that's right, if you're familiar with downtown, right at the foot of the Clemente Bridge as you come from the north side into town. It's that hotel there. And they decided to leave from there to drive to Washington, PA, where the wedding was. And they didn't take the interstate. Instead, they went through downtown and across the Liberty Bridge and through the Liberty Tunnel. And they took US-19 the whole way down into Washington, PA. And if you're familiar with that, and you're thinking about this in terms of like a Friday afternoon at, say, I don't know, 2.15, 2.30, you realize how absolutely stupid that idea is. And then to make it dumber, as they were coming in, they decided to stop at Dormont Park so they could do some photos before the wedding. Now, I'm from the South Hills, and I'm very pro-South Hills, and, and I know Dormont Park a little bit. I don't 
didn't really hang out there, but I know where it is and I know kind of what it's about. And for the life of me, I can't think of why you would stop to do wedding photos there, especially when you knew you were already late. But whatever. She finally gets to church at 410. And of course, then we have to get everybody seated and then the monstrosity of the procession. And we finally get everybody in and we're getting ready to start. And then the groom, the audacity of this groom, he leans forward and he says to me, hey, father, we're uh, we're behind schedule here. Is there anything you can do to, you know, speed this up a little bit? Well, the answer to the question is yes. There are things that we can do to speed this up a little bit. But the real answer to your question is no. No, we are not going to speed this up a little bit. You've made me wait for an hour and ten minutes. I will now take as much time as I want. I don't care about your schedule anymore. So, it was just awful. I've since come to find out that that couple's not married anymore. I don't think it has anything to do with the lack of punctuality or communication or poor planning. But, you know, whatever. And I suppose that details are irrelevant. But I'm just putting it out there. Like, we should be punctual for our weddings. So, and that was not, in the grand scheme of things, not the biggest disaster I've ever faced. So, point is, weddings are crazy. And you see that again in the gospel today with with these five foolish virgins, five foolish maidens is probably a better translation. Um, People, when it comes to weddings, they just do some things that are kind of dumb, that are just, are foolish. They're not wise. But we have to be careful when we use that word wise, because I think we misunderstand the word. Well, that's not fair. I think we understand the word, but we don't understand all of its meanings. And so when we we criticize brides who do silly things like take the absolute least efficient way to get to church and and deliberately show up an hour and ten minutes late, or when we look at five maidens that don't bring any additional oil for their lamps, we look at them and we say, oh, well, they're not wise because they're not practical, uh, because they're not efficient, because they're not doing, they're not productive in some kind of way. And that is one definition of wisdom. And I would, I would argue that that's very much the world's definition of wisdom. And it's a good definition. And it's not necessarily wrong, but there are layers to this word. And, and Jesus is intending it in a very different kind of way. So to understand what, what wisdom in the uh, context of God is, I guess, we have to kind of go back to go way back, go back to not necessarily the beginning, but to a pretty critical moment in salvation history. And we need to go back to what happened at Mount Sinai. As the people have escaped from Egypt, God has worked 10 different miracles in the presence of the Egyptians to show his might and his power and to soften or try to soften and eventually to break Pharaoh's heart so that he lets his people go. That he leads his people out from this place of slavery and into the desert, splits the Red Sea in two so they can escape, and then rushes the Red Sea back in upon Pharaoh's chariots and charioteers so that the people would truly be free. And then he leads them further into the desert so that he can take them to the promised land and deliver this, this land of flowing with milk and honey to them, to take it from the other nations and give it to his particular chosen people. And as they're on this journey, right, God leads them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he chooses to manifest himself. He wants to give the law to his people because he wants to establish this covenant relationship with them once for all. Here's my law. If you do these things and don't do these other things, you will be living properly. And you will be a witness to the rest of the world as to who I am. And people will know that I am your God and you are my people. But for him to manifest himself, it's this pretty terrifying, powerful, beautiful thing where the mountain is wreathed in smoke and fire and you hear God's voice is suddenly like a, like a trumpet blast or a peal of thunder and there's lightning and there's all this nonsense. And then Moses is the one who has to ascend the mountain. And everyone's afraid that Moses isn't going to be able to come back down because who can look on the face of God and live? And when Moses does come back down, his hair is snow white and his, his face is glowing because of, of what he has seen and how that has literally transformed him. And he comes down with the law that he gives to the people. But he also teaches them, I think, four important lessons, four, four things that they need to understand if they're going to, to be successful in doing this. So what he teaches them, the, these, these four things about relationship with God, what he teaches them is, first of all, truth. Like, what is the truth of God? And the truth of God is that he's a God of life. 
God of salvation, a God that desires true communion, a, a God that is love, right? He's not like these false gods of the Egyptians or, or any of these other pagan gods that they might encounter. But God is exactly what and who he says he is. He's not going to lie to his people. And he's not malicious or cruel or, or capricious or evil or any of those things. He's, he's life-giving. He is the cause of life. And he is the source of life. And, and he wants to be in communion with his people. He wants to know them. And he wants them to know him. He's not a loof or anything where he doesn't like occasionally just you know look down and like oh okay well there's my people and look at all their foolishness he wants to be very much enmeshed in their lives so first he has to teach the people the truth of god then he has to teach the people that they can have relief in their relationship with god which means that they don't have to be terrified of him anymore he's again he's not like some of these false gods he's not cruel he's not bloodthirsty he's not vindictive or manipulative or petty or any of that kind of stuff he is in fact loving and generations upon generations after this they will find out just how loving he is when they encounter jesus christ but but he is a very loving and kind god and so they don't have to fear him the way that they would have to necessarily fear some of these other pagan gods at the same time moses teaches them that they need to have fear of god but fear of God in the true sense of what that means. Not, again, that they're scared or terrified of him, but that they have this respectful reverence towards him. That he is, in fact, the God of, of creation, the God of salvation, the God that, that worked these ten plagues on the Egyptians and that manifested himself in, in such splendor on Mount Sinai. And yet, he desires to be with his people. He's all-powerful and, and doesn't need anything from them but wants something from them. And so there's a way to respond to that where it's you can be comfortable with God. You can be yourself with him, but you, you also need to be respectful and reverent, reverential towards him because of what he is. And so he teaches them not to be terrified, but to have a proper and healthy sense of fear. And then the most important thing, or at least fundamental to what we're talking about today, what Moses teaches the people is that they have to be wise and what wisdom really means. And so what wisdom means in this context is that the people have to know how to be close to God. And the easy way, at least on paper, the easy way is by being adherents of his law. If they do the things they're supposed to do and if they don't do the things they're not supposed to do, they're going to set themselves up so that they're in a position where they can be open to what it is that God is doing to them. That they can feel his presence and hear his voice and 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 open their hearts to, to whatever it is that he's trying to do on them so that they can truly be his people and authentically live as his witnesses in the world which is what he made them for that's what real wisdom is so when you look at the the parable that we heard today wisdom or lack of wisdom has nothing to do with oil for lamps but it does have everything to do with that whole sense of preparation so you have a bridegroom that is being delayed in his return, and that's not uncommon. The bridegroom would go to the house of his father-in-law to do final negotiations, to settle on the dowry, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes, in fact, maybe oftentimes, those negotiations would run perhaps a little bit longer than what anyone, anyone would expect. But it wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't that big of a deal. And so the wise virgins, they bring extra oil with them. Not because they're anticipating longer negotiations, but because they want to remain close to their Lord, right? The bridegroom here is pretty much a pretty clear representation of the Messiah. And the wise ones want to remain close to him. They're going to do the things they have to do so that they're ready for him whenever he comes. I mean, what if he wasn't delayed? Would they be foolish because they were carrying extra oil that they didn't need? Would they be foolish because they were wasteful? No, they would have been wise because they were well prepared for him. They wanted to remain close to him. But five of these maidens didn't bring any extra oil. And again, that's not foolishness in and of itself. They could have anticipated a short negotiation period. Their foolishness comes when it turns out that the groom is being delayed. And they have a chance at that point to fix this. They could have gone off and bought oil. They could have gone off and amended their life, or at least amended their plan for that afternoon, and changed some things so that they would be ready for their Lord when he comes. 
They could have changed some stuff so that they would have been able to have been close to him when he drew near. But they didn't go to the merchants at that point. Instead, they took a nap because they were drowsy and they were tired. Listen, I feel you on that. I understand what that feels like. But you know, you got to be responsible. you got to act wisely. And they just figured, someone else will do this work for me. But no one else can do this kind of work for you. You have to be the one to make yourself ready to be able to, to, to do the things that you have to do to know God. You have to be able to do the things you need to do to stay close to him. And so when they hear that the bridegroom's coming and they start asking the other, well, give us some of your oil. Well, no, I, I can't do this for you. You had your opportunities. You should have done this. I need to go and be close to my Lord. I can't help you anymore. This was your, ch- you had your chance to do this work, but you weren't wise. You were a fool. You wasted the opportunity. And I guess that's the question that, that we all have to consider. Are we wasting our opportunities? Are we being wise or are we being foolish? Are we doing the things that we have to do so that we can draw close to God? Because in the second reading, St. Paul reminds us that we're not going to escape from him, right? That there's going to come a time when we're all going to wind up in the same place. So we all need to start being wise. And that's something to reflect on today. Am I being wise according to the standards of the world and simply being practical and seeking seeking what? Praise and comfort and adulation and money? Stuff that's not going to last? Or am I being wise and doing the things that are drawing me ever closer to God that might lead me to being ridiculed or perhaps uncomfortable or unpopular or whatever it looks like but are going to get me, in fact, the prize of eternal life? We should beg God today to fill us with the gift of his wisdom and perhaps more importantly, the gift of his courage that we can choose to act wisely in this world so that together we can do the work of building up his kingdom here on earth and one day come to be happy with him in the kingdom of heaven.